welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today, we will be discussing the sinking of the Costa Concordia, a massive cruise ship that capsized off the island of Giglio in 2012. Before we dive in, I must inform you. The story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, the usage of strong language and obscenities, adultery, negligence, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before I begin that I am not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I have done my research and will present the information as I understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, I will be including the basics of nautical terminology in the description for anyone who needs it. In today's episode, there will be some terms in the Italian language in which I am not fluent, but I will do my best to give accurate pronunciations. There is a lot of controversy surrounding this ship, and some details that are debated. I will be transparent when we reach this point. I do have to be honest, there's a lot of mixed feelings surrounding this ship and a lot of information to unpack. Just know we are going to be focusing on the history of the ship and her sinking, rather than the drama around her captain and other legal battles that were hashed out afterward in order to keep the conversation focused in on the ship. But we will briefly mention these things where they are relevant. There is some new information coming out about Costa Concordia all the time, and some of the details in this episode may be antiquated as soon as I click publish, so please keep that in mind. Also keep in mind, with the vast amount of detail on the sinking, I may leave some out for brevity's sake. Now, with that out of the way, let's look at Costa Concordia. Costa Concordia was ordered by the Carnival Corporation in 2004 to join the Costa fleet, being ordered from the Fincantieri SPA shipyard based out of Trieste, Italy, and being built in their Seste Ponente yard in Genoa. She was known as yard number 6122 before she'd be named. Before we go further into Costa Concordia, we should unpack Carnival Cruises and Costa Cruise Lines to make things crystal clear. Don't worry, this history will be brief. Businesses will often have many different corporations, incorporations, subsidiaries, and whatnot to diversify, spread their brand, and increase profits. Carnival Corporation and PLC is no different, starting as Carnival Cruise Line in 1972. The company would grow and acquire the Holland America Line, Windstar Cruises, West Towers, Seabourn Cruise Line, Cunard Line, and Costa Cruises between the years of 1989 and 1999. As for Costa Cruises, their parent company, the Costa Crociere Group, were founded in 1854 and reorganized as a wholly owned subsidiary of Carnival in 2000. They are an Italian company based in Genoa that caters to the Italian cruise market, with a fleet of 11 ships currently, with many others laid up. So, Costa Cruises is the smaller company owned by Carnival Corporation, which is important to know when we do get into the legal details at the end of the episode. And this is the company that would create the Costa Concordia. She would be launched at Sestri Ponente on September 2nd, 2005, but it was an eerie launching. For many ships, it is customary to smash a bottle of champagne on the side of it during launching, and this is called christening. However, one Czech's Italian supermodel and actress Eva Erzogova released the ceremonial bottle from her grasp and it swung into the Costa Concordia. It merely bounced off the side of the ship and didn't break. This is incredibly bad luck according to legends from the shipping world back in the day, and it is considered so unlucky that they actually make the bottles of champagne for christenings much thinner and easier to break nowadays. This, of course, would later be blamed for the ship's misfortune later. The ship, which had yet to be named, was delivered to Costa Cruises on June 30th, 2006, and it cost 450 million euros in 2006's money, which was roughly 372 million pounds and 570 million US dollars in 2006 in order to build the behemoth. In today's cash, given the cumulative rate of inflation since 2005 of about 52.4%, that adds up to about 868 million eight hundred and ninety five thousand three hundred and ninety two dollars quite the chunk of change after she was delivered she would be named concordia the costa cruise line wanting to express their wish for quote continuing harmony unity and peace between european nations the ship was absolutely beautiful too costa concordia known by her call sign ibhd her IMO number 9320544, and her MMSI number 
500, was an enormous, beautiful Concordia-class cruise ship. She was 952 feet and 1 inch long, had a beam of 116 feet and 6 inches wide, a depth of 46 feet and 6 inches, and a draft of 26 feet and 11 inches. The ship spanned 13 public decks, with one being the lowest and 13 being the highest. And in keeping with their theme of the unity of the European nations, they named each deck after European country. They were Deck 1, Olanda, for Holland, Deck 2, Zesia, Sweden, Deck 3, Belgio, for Belgium, Deck 4, Grecia, for Greece, Deck 5, Italia, for Italy, Deck 6, Grand Britannia, for Great Britain, Deck 7, Irlanda, for Ireland, Deck 8, Portugal for Portugal, Deck 9, Francia for France, Deck 10, Germania for Germany, Deck 11, Spania for Spain, Deck 12, Austria, Deck 13, Polonia for Poland. I love this sentiment, and it's touching they took the time to name all of these decks after different countries. It also makes navigation a bit easier because it names each deck with something memorable for the passengers rather than something colder and more uninviting like a number. As for capacity, she averaged a crew of 1,100 and could carry a maximum of 3,780 passengers in 1,500 cabins, 505 of which had private balconies, and 55 of the most exclusive had direct access to the Samsara Spa. At the time, Costa Concordia's exercise facility was one of the largest in the world, including the Samsara Spa, a two-level fitness center that was 64,600 square feet large and included a gym, a sauna, classic Turkish bath, a solarium, and a thalassotherapy pool, which is a pool that uses seawater as a form of therapy. A Turkish bath, which was seen on Titanic as well, is a steam bath or a place of public bathing prominent in the Muslim culture. Costa Concordia also had five onboard restaurants, with Samsara and Club Concordia being reservations only dining, and 13 onboard bars, including a bougie cigar and cognac bar and a coffee and chocolate bar. I definitely hang out at the coffee and chocolate bar for sure. She also had four swimming pools, two of which had retractable roofs, five spas, five jacuzzis, and even a poolside movie theater on the main pool deck. If you were looking for entertainment on the Costa Concordia, there was a basketball court, a Grand Prix motor racing simulator, an internet cafe, a futuristic disco, a children's area fully equipped with video games, a casino, and a huge three-level theater for performances. Needless to say, she really had something for everyone. Many newer cruise ships have similar amenities, and it makes them extremely popular for family vacations, romantic getaways, or time to relax for retired couples. As for propulsion, she was powered by a diesel-electric power plant on board that consisted of six 12-cylinder Wartzilla 12V46C four-stroke medium-speed diesel generating sets that together had a combined power output of 102,780 horsepower. These six generators supplied power to everything on the ship, from hotel functions to propelling the ship. The ship was also propelled by two 21-megawatt electric motors coupled to fixed-pitch propellers. She also had emergency generators, as all ships do, which powered some emergency communications functions as well as lighting and a few other things. She was designed originally to reach 19.6 knots, but she surprised everyone when she achieved 23 knots in her sea trials. As for the ship's history, she was, for the most part, pretty successful. Under Captain Francesco Schettino, she would fare pretty nicely, except for an incident in 2008 and her notorious 2012 sinking. On November 22, 2008, Costa Concordia was docked in Palermo in Sicily, and high winds pushed the ship, smacking its bow against the dock. Thankfully, no one was injured or killed, and the ship was quickly patched up afterward in December, but there were still some dents visible. It was later fully repaired in 2011, when the entire ship would be refurbished and modernized for a new age. Now we get into the real deal here, the collision and ultimate capsizing of Costa Concordia. Some details here may be fuzzy, since there is data recovered from the VDR that differs with eyewitness testimony. Costa Concordia was scheduled for a seven-day cruise from Cita de Vecchia to Savona in Italy, with five ports of call in between. As a reminder to everyone, a port of call is just a stop in a cruise between point A and point B. 
The ship left Sidetavecchia on January 12, 2012, heading towards Savona with 3,206 passengers and 1,023 crew on board. On day two of the cruise, the ship was to pass the island of Giglio. On the evening of January 13, 2012, the ship was destined to pass close to the shore of the island of Giglio in what is called a sail-by salute. Captain Francesco Scatino had dinner with his mistress, Dominica Samorten, before heading to the bridge to help his crew navigate the sail-by salute. He'd done this route three or four times prior, so he felt very comfortable with these waters, and so he was going to eyeball the navigational route, which is a bad idea. Coastal navigation, which is any seafaring navigation close to the shore, is dangerous because of obstructions and heavier traffic. And so, most navigational officers on ships have to chart their course every 15 minutes, noting where they are in relation to their planned course. In open water, they only have to chart their location every hour, so coastal navigation is incredibly important to get right. Well, not only was Scatino going to wing it, but according to First Officer Ciro Ambrosio, the captain had left his reading glasses in his cabin and needed the radar to be checked for him. He was giving the helmsman different numbers to communicate different degrees of turns and which direction. Unfortunately, the helmsman did not speak Italian very well, since Costa and many other cruise lines were, and still are, notorious for hiring crew members from poorer countries because they could pay them less. And so there was a language barrier between the crew. We do have to note that not only was he unable to read his radar and he was navigating by sheer luck, but he also had his mistress on the bridge, which was completely inappropriate, and the ship was moving at a staggering 16 knots. While the ship was midway through a turn near the island to begin the sail by salute, Scatino noticed breakers directly ahead of the ship and quickly relayed different instructions to the helmsman, but it was too late. The port side of the ship struck a chartered reef called Le Skull at around 9.45 p.m., which was about 870 yards to the south of the entrance to the harbor of Giglio Porto. The most seaward exposed rock of Le Skull, known as Scola Piccola, sat 26 feet below the water and tore a 160-foot gash in the port side of Costa Concordia's hull below the waterline. Later, two large strips of steel torn from the ship would be recovered on the seabed about 315 feet from the island. Costa Concordia, in regulation, was able to stay afloat with two of her watertight compartments flooded. Unfortunately, three to five of these compartments were torn into upon the initial impact, so from there, the ship was doomed. A few minutes after impact, Captain Scatino would receive even worse news. The first room affected was the engine room, and the generators and engine were slowly being submerged. The head engineer would have to manually turn on and off the emergency generator to keep it running without overheating, and so that was the only way emergency functions were still available on Costa Concordia. However, that does not include any sort of maneuvering or propulsion, and so she was adrift. The ship would drift because of Newton's first law of motion, or the law of inertia, which states that an object at rest will stay at rest and an object in motion will stay in motion unless affected by an outside force. So Costa Concordia was moving at a staggering 16 knots when she struck the rock, which is insanely fast for coastal navigation. With all of this inertia, she continued going forward, gradually slowing due to the friction of the ship moving in the water. She'd continue north past Giglio Porto, then turning and drifting back south in the current and coming to rest at Punta Gabinara. Scatino attesting his brilliant maneuvering had gotten her there, though that is heavily debated. According to the chief of the Italian Coast Guard, the ship is believed to have drifted there by 10.44 p.m. Let's back up for a moment. According to Costa Cruz's managers, Costa Concordia was scheduled to perform a sail by salute, which is entirely normal. However, her planned chart was supposed to be about five miles offshore. Instead, Costa Concordia was only 330 yards from the shore when she struck rocks. That is a severe deviation from the planned route, and it was stated that that was not planned by Costa or any computer system, but by Scatino himself. Back to the Costa Concordia, she began listing almost immediately, with plates and other items sliding around the ship eerily. Passengers had reported a sudden loud bang and shaking, though they were initially told by crew that it was simply an electrical failure and not to panic. Passengers also reported the listing was sudden to the port side, and plates crashed to the floor with people falling and screaming in fear. When the ship eventually turned around, the listing shifted to 20 degrees to the starboard side, curiously enough. 
and it would continue to list to the starboard side as the ship rested on the seabed, with passengers not being told to put on life jackets and go to their muster stations until the ship's list became severe. Even at 10.20, passengers were putting on their life jackets and were being told by the crew that everything was fine and to return to their cabins. After enough passengers made their way to their muster stations, they finally called for the order to abandon ship at 10.50 p.m. At this point, trying to evacuate passengers on the lifeboat deck would be almost impossible. Most modern cruise ships have electrical davits that lower boats into the water, and they don't work safely when the ship lists past 12 to 15 degrees. Another failing is that almost immediately after calling for passengers to abandon ship, instead of staying at the bridge and coordinating the evacuation, Captain Scatino and most of the officers left the bridge to abandon ship themselves. We do have to give credit where credit is due. They had contacted the shore stating they were taking on water, but they were very coy with the port of Livorno's harbor master, essentially saying they were fine. Not believing this, the Italian Coast Guard was deployed, but it would take about an hour by helicopter for them to arrive. People were being evacuated by some crew, though most of the multinational personnel had positions that didn't require seamen's qualifications, like cooks and entertainment staff, and supposedly they'd received basic safety training to participate in evacuations like this, though there had not been a lifeboat drill done before leaving port, and so none of the crew and passengers had practiced together. Many of these same crew also didn't speak Italian, but at least spoke a small amount of English. So again, there was a huge language barrier. Some of the passengers fervently alleged that many of the crew members did not help or were not trained in assisting with lifeboats, though this allegation was of course denied. Much of this story, if you can't tell, is he said, she said. When the Coast Guard arrived on the scene, they had a hard time finding the ship, since they weren't expecting it to already be partially underwater with people crawling down a ladder off the side of it to the lifeboats below. Scatino, of course, by this time was already on shore, allegedly having disembarked around 11.30 p.m. When the Coast Guard arrived, they jumped into action, using five helicopters between them, the Navy, and the Air Force to airlift survivors from the ship, as well as the local fire chief stating he and his men, quote, plucked 100 people from the water and saved around 60 others who were trapped in the boat. Now, here's where the story is absolutely awesome. The hero of this story is an officer of the Italian Coast Guard named Captain Gregorio de Falco, and he was a captain from Livorno. Seeing that Captain Scatino had left the ship, he had an angry, lengthy conversation with him that included the iconic phrase that would find itself on t-shirts after the disaster, Vada a bordo caso, which means get the fuck back on board, or get back on board for fuck's sake, depending upon who you ask. These calls were between DeFalco and Scutino on Scutino's personal cell phone, one of which occurred around 1.30 in the morning. I'll link the conversation for you here on the screen. As for the evacuation at 1.04 a.m., an Air Force officer who'd been lowered on board via helicopter reported back that there were 100 people on board the sinking vessel, with the ship's priest claiming he was among one of the last groups to leave around 1.30 a.m. The evacuation wouldn't be noted as complete on the Port of Livorno's harbor master log until 4.46 a.m. As for the missing, there would be a search conducted between January 14th and 30th of 2012. Divers described the conditions as disastrous, with floating furniture in the dark space making the dive dangerous. Divers did find trapped people, finding a South Korean newlywed couple trapped in the room and shivering after they'd slept through the disaster, rescuing them on January 14th. They also found the ship's purser that day with a broken leg. In total, 32 people died in the disaster, with the last body being recovered on November 3, 2014 in the wreckage of the ship. While bodies were being recovered and the containment and cleanup process of oil and other substances released by the ship were underway, there was significant looting with things like the ship's bell, cash registers, and even room keys being stolen and sold on sites like eBay. This is just disgusting to me. I can't imagine diving into this ship where people had perished just to make a quick buck. On February 12th, 2012, after weeks of weather delays, Dutch salvage firm Smit International was acting jointly with an Italian company called Neri Spa, and they started to remove the ship's heavy fuel oil, with the tanks in the forward part of the ship being completely emptied by February 20th. On March 3rd, they cut a hole into the engine room to retrieve the rest of the oil, with operations resuming March 12th and being completed by March 24th. After the fuel was removed, the removal of the wreck was to begin. Honestly, the scrapping of this vessel was ingenious. 
On April 21, 2012, the Florida-based marine salvage and wreck removal company Titan was awarded the contract to refloat and tow away the coast of Concordia, alongside their partner company, Mico Perry, an Italian firm that specialized in undersea engineering solutions. The salvage operation was estimated to take about 12 months and cost around $300 million, using the port of Civita Vecchia as its base of operations. Once Costa Concordia was in port, she would be disassembled and sold for scrap. The salvage plan was as follows. Step 1. Secure the hull to the land with steel cables to keep the wreck from slipping further into the water. Step 2. Build a large horizontal platform underneath the wreck. Step 3. Attach sponsons, which would help stabilize the wreck and make it more buoyant to the port side of the hull. Step 4. Using winches, bring the hull back to a vertical position onto the platform. Step 5. Attach sponsons to the starboard side of the hull to further stabilize the ship in an upright position. Step 6. Refloat the hull in tanks. And finally, step 7. Tow to an Italian port for scrapping. This scrapping was incredibly creative and took an enormous amount of engineering skill and a lot of hard work. It took until September 2013, but she was upright again and ready for her final voyage, being towed to Genoa in July of 2014. On July 27, 2014, she arrived in Genoa, being moored against a wharf that was built specifically for her for the scrapping to begin. The dismantling began, and then she'd be towed to the Super Bacino dock in Genoa on May 11, 2015 to remove the upper decks. The last of the sponsons were removed in August of 2016, with the rest of the hull being taken to a dry dock on September 1st of that year for the final scrapping, which was completed in July of 2017, with 53,000 tons of materials being able to be recycled. In this way, Costa Concordia does live on in some way or another. After the wreck was removed, however, there was still a disaster left behind at the wreck site. Costa Corsier put Michael Perry in charge of remediation of the salvage site, and this project was called Phase WP9. This was supposed to start at the end of 2014, cost roughly $85 million, and take roughly 15 months for the completion of the project. This was mainly consisting of cleaning the ocean floor, anchor block removal, platform removal, and grout bag removal. However, this project took much longer than 15 months and it continued all the way into May of 2018. Luckily, after cleaning up after the disaster, the fish population and the health of the environment actually improved from before the sinking, so that was one of the only positives. As for the compensation for the passengers, they received what is internationally obligated to them, which is 11,000 euros to cover airfare back home and any lost belongings, which is roughly $11,730 in today's exchange rates. Obviously, there were some passengers that fought this in court because that doesn't cover the cost of losing a loved one, and really no sum of money would. It's not clear how many of these claims moved forward or if any received heftier settlements. The island of Giglio even sued for damages to the island, but again, it's unclear if they received damages. As for the loss to Costa Cruises, the loss of the ship was a constructive total loss, with damages upwards of $500 million. Shares in Costa Cruises fell initially by 18% on January 16, 2012, following a statement that the grounding could cost Carnival Corporation around $95 million. The insurer's success on the vessel was $30 million, with the group of cruise lines owned by Carnival comprising 49% of the worldwide cruise industry. The company owns 101 cruise ships, of which Coast Concordia represented 1.5% of its capacity. In the first 12 days after the disaster, booking volumes for Carnival's fleet, which included Costa, was down by the mid-teens as a percentage of year-earlier bookings. Of course, this story has a massive inquiry and legal drama that follows. We are going to keep it brief to keep the focus on the ship itself. Know that Costa Cruz Lines assigned most of the blame on the captain and crew themselves, absolving themselves of much of the guilt. Scatino and five other officers would be prosecuted, though much of the guilt and scrutiny laid with Scatino. He'd be tested for cocaine use, with traces of the substance being found in hair samples, quote, but not within the hair strands or in his urine, which would have indicated he had used the drug, according to the Associated Press. So, he may or may not have used cocaine at some point in his life, but not likely on the evening the Costa Concordia sank. His lover, Dominica Sunorton, has been admitted as a passenger without paying for a ticket, and it was found her presence on the bridge, quote, generated confusion and distraction for the captain. In February of 2015, Captain Francesco Scatino was convicted and sentenced to 16 years in prison for manslaughter and causing a shipwreck. He is currently serving the sentence in Rebibia Prison, Rome. 
Industry response was swift. Now, before leaving any port, even if you just got on the ship, it is mandatory that lifeboat drills are done. Rest assured that sail by salutes are no longer tolerated in Italy either, so those seem to be becoming a thing of the past. Safety training requirements have become stricter in the United States for Northern American cruising as well. Ships also have to carry more life jackets, and the access to the bridge is strictly limited. If you take a cruise this summer, and you're immediately part of a muster drill, the Costa Concordia disaster is the one ship we can truly thank for this necessary and almost obvious safety regulation. This is where we are going to stop on the Costa Concordia disaster. Maybe sometime in the future, we will revisit this and the following inquiry. If that's something you'd be interested in, please let me know down in the comments section. Hopefully, this episode did a small amount of justice for the victims of the disaster and helps keep their memories alive. Rest in peace to all who perished, and I hope those who suffered in this disaster and are still with us are able to find peace. As for Costa Concordia's captain, I hope he has learned from this experience and is able to move forward, but is never allowed to captain a vessel again. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and interact with us. And don't forget to check out our second channel, Speed Force Media. Tune in next Sunday for the story of the Yamato, the largest battleship of World War II. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.